Great. Um, welcome to today's webinar on harnessing Microsoft Fabric and OpenAI. My name is Ben Jarvis. I'm CTO at Adatus, and um, I'll be joined today by Adam Andrew, who's one of our principal AI consultants, Dan Billsborough, who's one of our senior consultants, and Karina Peters, who's another one of our senior consultants. So in terms of the agenda for today's session, I'll, I'll be kicking off with a, an introduction to Microsoft Fabric and how it can potentially help us enable AI. I'll then hand over to Karina, who's going to talk us through some of the Fabric migration pathways where, where you've got an existing workload that you want to move over to Fabric. We're gonna look at what the different approaches to doing that are. I'll then pass over to Dan, who's going to give us a live demo of, of Fabric. And then I'll pass over to Adam, to give us a live demo of Azure OpenAI. So we'll kick off with a quick introduction to, to Fabric and, and AI. So you've probably all seen articles like these in the news over the past year about how AI is going to change the world and replace whole industries. But let's take a quick look at the reality of it. So machine learning and generative AI have been around for a number of years now. And the advent of generative AI is really the first time that we've seen it come into the hands of the general public with tools like ChatGPT. And from that, we've begun to see lots of really useful use cases coming about. And we've started to really see the buy-in from people within the business into actually using this technology in their day-to-day their -day working life. And there's lots of really useful use cases for AI, and these really fit into three buckets. The first is decision support, which is where we were looking to use AI or machine learning to analyze lots of disparate data sets and summarize them so that we can make a prediction or provide us with the information that's needed to make a decision. The second is around operational efficiency, and that's where we're looking to use AI to improve our productivity by automating some of those mundane manual tasks that, that take up lots of our time. And then the final one is building innovative products and services. And that's where we're looking to use AI to improve customer experience within our applications. And that could be by building chatbots that help streamline customer support, or it could be by building recommendation engines that will recommend the right product at the right time to our customers. So there's lots of really transformative things that we can do with AI that will, will actually help us improve our working lives. So, it's all well and good wanting to adopt AI, but there's one key problem that impacts many organizations. And that's the fact that if we put poor quality data into AI and machine learning models, then we're guaranteed to get poor quality results out. Is that whole thing of garbage in equals garbage out. So in order to overcome this, we need to have a stage prior to our models um, where we ingest data cleanse it and conform it into a standardized format and then enrich that with other useful attributes. And that curated data can then be passed to our models in order to give them the best possible chance, chance of giving a correct result. So what we want to do is do all of that work up front. So we're improving the quality of that data and, and we're creating some really high quality data that we can then put into those AI models. So they're then giving us really high quality results and actually enabling us to, to achieve some of those objectives. So to build these curated data sets, the best option is to build out a data platform. And a data platform contains all of the services we need to ingest data, cleanse it, transform it, and then serve it up to our, our applications. And this is all sat on top of a data lake with the right governance in place to, to secure and catalog our data. And typically when we're, we're building a data platform, it's a bit like playing with Lego. So the platform we're building on is our Lego base. So that could be Azure or it could be a, another cloud. And we need to select the right blocks with the right attributes and put them together in the right order. So that we build a nice lakehouse architecture. So we want to, to make sure that we're combining the right services and combining them in the right way so we can build out that strong and stable platform for us to, to transform our data sets and, and start to create that clean, high quality data on. And technology is a really small part of this architecture, but we also need to consider things like enablement. So that's giving users the right tools to make use of the data with the correct guardrails in place when they're actually making use of that data to ensure it's being done in the right way. Then we've got guardianship. 
So that's ensuring that data is secured and governed appropriately to prevent misuse. And then finally, we've got the most important part, which is the people. And that's ensuring that we've got the right buy-in from the business and have the right training in place to enable them to begin using that data to make decisions. So Microsoft Fabric aims to solve some of these problems by bringing all of the tools we know and love from the data platform point of view into a single SaaS platform. So this platform includes tools such as Power BI, Data Factory, Spark, Custo and SQL. And all of these are packaged up into a single SaaS platform. And that SaaS platform is underpinned by a single unified data lake that's called One Lake. And this allows us to centrally govern and control all of our data. And that means that we, we, give, we can give the business the ability to self-serve, but with the right guardrails in place to ensure that we're controlling how that data is used. And Fabric provides us with the, the technical components to easily deliver that secure and scalable lake house in a short amount of time. But it also provides us with a number of features to assist in other challenges. So from the technology side, as we said, it's providing us with that scalable and secure SaaS platform. And because it's a, a SaaS environment, we can deliver value really quickly. And where we've got multiple tool sets in the platform, we can start to use the right tool at the right time. So if we're processing data in real time, we might choose to use Custo, where if we're looking to process data in more of a batch based manner, then we might use a tool like Spark or SQL to do that. From the enablement side, it's it's got tools for both citizen and pro developers. So we've got tools like Spark, which are, are aligned more to our, our sort of professional developers. And we've got tools like Dataflows that are aligned to citizen developers. So it's open to everyone and, and has tools that are suitable for everyone. And because it's built on top of the Power BI platform, it has the right guardrails in place to enable self-service. So we've got all of those controls in place so that we can open those data sets up to the wider business and allow them to start using that data and, and delivering some value from it. We've also got the ability to endorse our data sets so we can control whether a data set has been produced centrally and has been through the right quality controls, we can give it a kite mark and say that we, we know that data is tested and we know it's valid and can be used by anyone in the organization. Where some of those data sets that have been created through self-service, we might want to apply a bit more um, a bit more control over those before people actually make use of them. From the guardianship side, we've got centralized governance. So we've got that one lake environment with all of your data in one place, which makes it quite simple to, to apply governance on. We've got a single security model that includes data loss prevention. So we can make sure our data is secured appropriately and make sure we've got the right controls in place to secure it. And then we've also got integration with Purview. So we can start to catalog that data and understand what data exists in our environment and where those data sets are being used. And then finally, from the people side, um, it provides a single environment for collaboration. So everybody from your data engineers to your data scientists and your individual users within the business is working in a single tool. And that makes it really easy for them to collaborate together and work together to deliver the best outcomes. And the tooling is very familiar for those that are familiar with the Microsoft ecosystem. So if you've used Office 365, then Fabric will be very familiar. And be, again, because we're in that SaaS environment, we can create a really quick feedback loop. So we can get data into the tool really quickly and start delivering value from it. And that helps to show that, helps to get the business brought into the tool and helps to get them working with us to deliver those data sets. So we're delivering data that, that aligns to their, their business objectives. So that's a quick introduction to, to Fabric. So from the pricing point of view, it's charged by your individual usage of each service. And each service burns a different portion of your, your overall capacity. And there's now one option to begin utilizing Fabric, which is to purchase a Fabric SKU. And these are available in the Azure portal and they're charged by the minute. And the capacities can be paused or resumed based on your usage and you're only charged for, for what you use. The lower SKUs, particularly in the, the F2 range, make it really cheap and easy to get started with Fabric. And there's a 60 day free trial that's available for you to, to start testing the capabilities and, and actually making use of it. Um, there, there was previously a way to, to 
um, utilised fabric using a Power BI premium SKU. But as of last week, it was announced that that method will be retired later this year. So the recommendation now is to use a fabric SKU going forwards. So that's using the pricing model that's, that's shown on the screen. So in terms of our approach at Adatus to Fabric, we, we take the underlying tools that Microsoft is providing in the, the platform, and then we're applying accelerators that we've developed on top of that to, to make the process as quick and easy as possible to, to get that environment stood up in Fabric with the right best practices applied and allow developers to, to start delivering value as quickly as possible using standardized patterns to, to do that. And with this, we now have a fabric reference architecture that takes the, the same approach as, as um, existing platforms that we're building using tools such as Databricks, um, but using the tools that are native to fabric. So that enables us to, to deliver a platform using a standardized architecture that aligns to all of the best practices that are out there right now. So in the, the Today's session is, is focused on how Fabric can help with, with um, implementing AI applications. And in the AI world, we can build something that looks like this, where we're basically taking data from various different sources. So they could be things like our ERP systems, CRMs, SaaS applications that we use in the organization, as well as things like IoT devices and custom applications that we've developed. We can then use Fabric to, to go through those four stages that I mentioned previously of ingesting that data, cleansing it, conforming it, and then enriching it. And then we can push that data into tools such as Cosmos DB and Azure AI Search. And that data can then be used by our intelligent applications that use services such as the Azure Open AI service. So we can use Fabric to give us that data, that strong data foundation to build on top of and allow us to have good quality data to push into those AI models. And we'll show you during the, the, some of the demos how you can do that and how Azure OpenAI fits into the, the picture. Um, I'll pass over to Karina now to talk through the migration paths. Hi, uh, okay, I'm just taking some control. So, Microsoft have made uh, Fabric to be very dynamic and versatile. So they've made it so that you can integrate Fabric in different ways at different times. And here at Adatus, we've been building and developing to see the options and give our opinions on the best way to migrate Fabric with the following technologies and tools. Using Fabric in this adaptable way allows, the con allows yourself to be able to migrate to Fabric at your own pace and without the need to rewrite all the current existing code you have. In some cases, the migration might be a lift and shift, but in other cases, there'll be the, the need to re-engineer some of the workload. Microsoft have been working on this and they've made significant progress since the initial drop of Fabric and are continuing to do so. There are multiple blogs that we've written on the Adatus website, which um, go into the details of the different technologies um, and how and when you can use them to uh, migrate to Fabric. One of the main differences between Fabric and Azure is the data storage. Fabric doesn't have a dedicated pool or a relational storage. Instead, it uses data warehouse uh, data, which is persisted in the Delta Lake format within the one lake. So mm -hmm. when looking to migrate to Fabric, we need to assess the workloads first, considering some of the following items, your type of workload, your source system types, the type of data being processed or the current implementation and so forth. Once uh, this data has all been collected, we can start to understand which migration pathway would be the most beneficial. As you can see on the slide shown, we have grouped together technologies and suggested our migration paths into Fabric. We've grouped them into five paths, but using three different types of solutions. So the on-prem application and Azure signups dedicated, we would suggest using Fabric with the data warehouse as a storage. The on-prem application, uh, signups dedicated and on-prem applications would use Fabric within the data warehouse migration path. Azure signups availability to mount existing pipelines from ADF and signups into Fabric. Uh, there's no need to change or build from the ground up. They are there are longer terms to upgrade the paths to turn the pipelines into native pipelines. So 
we recommend using the fabric service and the tools within it where needed, but being able to use a data warehouse to structure your existing data and present to, to the consumer. This will give you the opportunity to keep your end-to-end -end data processing within the Fabric space, but also enhance your current code and set it up within the Fabric framework. So what about when we move to Databricks? So within, with using Azure Databricks, stay put. You can use Fabric for serving. You can connect to the lake with Databricks and are able to read and write, allowing you to use Databricks as you currently are, with the addition of your architecture being within the Fabric service and supporting it. The use of this is the same as what is currently done within the cloud structure. You can connect to Databricks, workspaces, and to the lake and path structure you need. So, for on-prem and Azure, including Synapse, Spark, and Serverless, we have recommended the business analytics reference architecture, which Ben has already discussed and Dan will be dem demonstrating for you shortly. Why do we recommend this migration path? The on-prem fabric with its unification of data store and standardization on the data lake allows you to eliminate multiple current issues with the on-prem, such as data duplication and silos. Fabric has made it easy to connect to on-premise data sources, as well as cloud, allowing the option to keep the on-prem services if required. You can, you can perform your ETL and ELT on Fabric with the Lakehouse architecture end-to-end -end using data sources, ingestion, transformation, and store, and consume, making it an end-to-end -end process. You're able to keep the overall architecture the same and minimize the code changes when you only replace the cloud deployment with the service fabric application. It allows you to migrate slowly and in phases if required and keeping a BOU set up whilst making the necessary changes. So the Azure Spark serverless, Fabrics Lakehouse and Data Warehouse and serverless SQL all share the same engine at their core. Fabric uses Delta Lake at its core, and there are a few routes you can take to convert your data if you're not already using a data lake. Using Spark jobs or notebooks, you can read the parquet data and write to the data frame to the data lake table. Fabric supports this. Along with these <clears throat> migration paths, Fabric has also recently announced some Fabric deployment patterns, which allow you to go hand in hand with these and gives you patterns to be able to focus on governance, security, administration, DevOps, usability, performance and scale, and billing and cost management. So on that point, I will pass over to Dan for him to demo across Fabric for you. Let me just share my screen. Oh, wrong screen, I'll try that again, shall I? Right, correct screen. Cool. So yeah, as, as Karina said, I'm going to just give a an end-to-end -end demo of of Fabric, really going from sort of well data ingestion all the way to kind of reporting at the end, really, and a little look at, at Power BI Copilot at the end as well. So yeah, with any sort of data platform, you you start with the data uh, data sources. So the way we're doing that in this example is using data pipelines, a very simple copy activity, which again, if you used data factory or synapse pipelines you'll be quite used to very simple copy activity where we choose our source choose our destination um, obviously i've just hard coded it for this example but we could add in parameters if we wanted to the example of you know multiple tables or multiple files and and looping through them that that could all be done fairly fairly straightforward in this example choosing the destination as our as, as a lake house which is that kind of bronze area we call it raw here but that's sort of you know very first layer of of the data platform to get it from the source into into fabric so if we just look at that very briefly you can see this is that lake house uh, i've got this raw folder and you see we've got our products file here from that point it's not particularly useful in its current format it's potentially not been sort of validated or cleansed in any way the data could be yeah not very useful in its current format so that's when the next stage is using a notebook. So a notebook allows for this interactive kind of experience where you can choose, in this instance, I'm using PySpark, but you could choose to use Spark SQL instead if you, if you wanted to, for example. And essentially what we're trying to do is get the data from bronze to silver. So basically from a, a state that's not very cleansed to a, to a cleansed state. So here you can just see that I'm specifying this schema and then I'm using that schema here to, to basically read that file into a, into a data frame. I'm just displaying it here to check it all looks all looks good, display, displaying fine. 
And then here's where you could do kind of as much or as little cleansing as, as you want to. Uh, it's sort of normal part of the ELTL process here, obviously just very simply removing any nulls, but you could do, like I say, as much or as little as you wanted. I think touching on the kind of AI point, I think this is the sort of first instance in the in the ETL where that sort of an AI use case might appear in terms of things like anomaly detection and data quality checking. I think that's, like I say, the first instance where that you could use the AI tools to be able to help augment the developer experience there. And then we're just looking and then we're just really writing it to, to base or silver in Delta format so that it's in a cleanse state and ready for, for further processing. So if we just briefly look at that again, you can see this is the table it doesn't look too much different to, to before. We haven't done a whole ton of cleansing on it. It's not been modeled in any way at this point, um, but just to show that it's that it's in this lake house. Again, at this point, it's, it, it, users probably could use it. It's not been modeled, but it, it at least is cleansed. So maybe you're more kind of data science use cases. And as Ben alluded to earlier, you know, if, you, if it's garbage in, then it's going to be garbage out. But really, at this point, you're starting to get the data in a, in a better position to kind of look to build that foundation of, of the data for any further sort of AI capabilities that you want to develop. So further from that, then, is to be able to actually get the data into the a kind of state of a data product or something that's actually going to be useful for end users. So in this example, I've just created a, a fact table. I've done some kind of very basic logic. And again, this example, you can see that I've, I'm using SQL here instead. So it's it's great that users can either choose to use you know, PySpark or SQL, depending on what they're more comfortable with. Just some very basic logic here to derive a, a discounted amount column with this example data that we're using. And then again, similar to before, adding really as much or as little sort of auditing lineage and, and things like that, really. And then again, you could, you know, here I'm just sort of overwriting the data. You could come up with a, a merge pattern or a delta pattern or something like that, really, to to put your delta into the into the fact tables. And then just a bit of a bit of cleanup at the end. One thing that I think it's worth sort of sharing, as I've, I've gone through those different services, there is that in this example, I've got them all in one in one workspace. You can see that here it says source control. These are, or most of these, apart from the couple that say unsupported, the ones that are synced and uncommitted, they've all got Git integration. So that means that everything I've showed you there integrates quite nicely with Git. I could, you know, tick these because I've changed them and I could add a, add a commit message and then commit these and they're now all in all in source control fairly easily. So that integration is, is, is quite simple there. And you can see then that it's all, all in a, a repository, all quite neatly stored for you. Um, so again, it kind of handles quite good at handling that lifecycle management um, aspect to any data platform. The other thing I wanted to show is once we've got this kind of curated area, we've got our data products. So you can see here, we've got our, our fact table here, a couple of dimensions. One thing that you then get with a lake house is a default semantic model. Now it doesn't do any of the kind of joining for you or do any sort of clever measures necessarily, but what it does do is it makes it a lot easier and slicker to go from your sort of data, or traditional data warehouse, and rather than having to sort of manage a semantic, semantic model separately, it's all quite a bit more um, tightly integrated, which which makes it a lot a lot easier. You could just go to manage default semantic model, tick what tables you want, bring them in, and it's all all fairly straightforward. Another thing worth mentioning is. If I hover over that, you can see that the storage mode is direct lake. Now, this is something that's new with Fabric, and essentially the concept is that it's, it's kind of the benefit of direct query and import modes, where direct query was great because you could have effectively real-time data, but performance wasn't always great when you got to higher data volumes. But then import mode is quite the opposite, where the performance was great, but you'd need to refresh your data every, every time and, and bring it into memory, and it was, it was quite slow from that point of view. Direct Lake basically merges the two where you should get very decent performance, but then also have the benefit of effectively real time data as well. So that's just something to, to note there. And again, it, within this, you can kind of create all your measures and do all the things you'd expect to do in a, in a semantic model, such as, yeah, like I say, create new measures, hiding columns, um, all these sort of like advanced features around putting them in folders, changing how their data summarizes, all the sort of things you used to in a semantic model you can you can do here fairly simply. The last thing I really wanted to show is just the ability of Copilot within, within Fabric. So as you can see here, I've got this little kind of button, which is Copilot. What that will do then is bring up this, this Copilot pane, and it will give you a couple of kind of starter prompts. So you can see in this example, it's kind of given me this, and I've just extended that to say, um, basically, just create me a page that shows me the performance of brands, because this example data we've got is all just around products and brands. So that's effectively my prompt. And this is really what it's what it's come up with. 
Now, a lot of it or some of it is is not overly useful. Some of these things around sort of a created date time, that's more for, for auditing. But actually, I think what it does show is it's not necessarily kind of going to give you it 100 percent straight away. But in terms of augmenting the developer experience and just facilitating and speeding up development, I think it's definitely useful because, like I say, all I've had to do is put in that prompt. But actually, I've got some quite decently useful um, useful visualizations here. You know, this if we change the name of that to say sort of like total sales, or if we change the name of this to say, you know, unique number of products or the average um, kind of price of a discounted product, all of a sudden you've actually got some quite useful visualizations there. And then some of the other ones that you don't want, you can simply delete them anyway. So it's not too, not too tricky. And like I say, just helps to sort of augment and speed up that developer experience a little bit. It's even put in a filter and things in as well. So again, just speeds things up a little bit. So that's really what I wanted to show there in that kind of whistle stop tour of an end to end in fabric. I want to pass over to, to Adam now, who will show you some of the capabilities in Azure OpenAI. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, hi, everyone. So hopefully that's useful in terms of seeing how fabric can be used as a um, as a foundation really upon which we can build reporting products for example or potentially open AI based products um, probably worth covering before I jump into a demo that open AI as a service can be integrated through sort of API calls throughout the ATL process could be for things like data quality it could be for for example extracting structured data from unstructured content that we might find in a database inside our lake house um, but really what we're going to get into here is using building on that foundation. So if we've got a lot of information in fabric in a lake house and let's say that that's unstructured data documents, for example, how can we use that to start, you know, really driving business decisions and give us a window into our data sort of via uh, natural language prompts. So I'll share my screen. Um, yep. Great stuff. OK. Um, so what I'm showing here is a uh, it's an application it's built in uh, React JS, um, and this is basically a a Q and A system that we use for um, sort of internal knowledge as well as sort of bid response. Um, it's probably worth touching before I jump in around um, sort of what Azure Open AI is and does and how it can be used. So um, yeah, Azure Open AI it's a way of creating. Uh, sort of specific instances of sort of AI services that are, you know, accessible to us within our organization only via things like a key and an endpoint. Um, it's separate to ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT used to use uh, GPT 3.5 as a large language model. Um, what Azure OpenAI does, it lets you sort of choose various different models and create your own sort of custom deployment of that. Um, if anyone's used ChatGPT before, you probably, you know, asked it some questions and maybe got it to produce some content for you, or even, you know, guide your thinking for, you know, your own sort of writing or responding to an email, blogs, that sort of stuff. Um, what we're going to demonstrate in this is around using what's called Retrieval Augmented Generation or RAG. Um, so what RAG does is it basically grounds our our responses and the way that we interact with the natural language um, sort of engine, the LLM. Uh, it grounds it in our data so that we're basically querying our own data and not going beyond that to make sure that the answers that we're getting are actually truthful. Uh, we can rely on them from a business point of view and that they're actually driving value as opposed to hallucinations and the kind of thing that could come out of um, you know, chat GPT if we're asking about our own company or our own subject matter, for example. So um, I'll log into this, which gives me a few options up here. Um, so we're going to focus on the chat bot. But before I do that, I'm going to go into some settings and just let's have a look at what kinds of things we might need to have in place before we can start using this in earnest. So the first thing that we need is an API key. Um, this authenticates us into our own sort of custom deployment. We need an endpoint, which is the pointer towards our our deployment. Uh, we've got actual deployments, which is one for completions, which is the model that we want to use to actually generate um, generate responses and process our inputs. And then an embeddings model, which is how we how we sort of bridge the gap, if you like, by turning a natural language prompt into something that's vectorized. I .e. it turns it into basically a long string of numbers that can then be compared to a representation within our data set. Um, 
other things that you've probably seen, you can specify within ChatGPT as with this, uh, things like max output and tokens. So how many tokens do we want to limit uh, or set as a minimum for our response? And do we want to use a vector database or do we want to go with sort of vanilla um, chat GPT capability? I'll stick with that for now and hit apply. Um, and then I'll navigate to my chatbot. So I've got a few a few prompts that I'm going to put through this uh, to sort of demonstrate how this works and how uh, retrieval augmented generation compares to your sort of standard vanilla uh, large language model interaction. Um, Quick health warning, this is generative AI, the keyword being generative. So whatever I type in here, the response will be novel, i.e. they'll be you know, generated on the fly, which means that despite the fact that I've tested this at least 12 times this morning, I can't guarantee the results. Um, so with that said, uh, let's start asking it some questions. So something dead easy, um, how many people live in London? Um, and it should give me an answer of around 9 million people. Uh, so 8.98, that's much more specific than it gave me earlier, so it must be learning. Um, so this is demonstrating that, yes, we can sort of ask the question and it can give us a truthful answer. Good start. Um, that's not hugely useful in a business context. What we might want to do, for example, is to ask, uh, ask the bot to produce us a sort of stock or template answer to an RFP question, for example. This is something that we do a lot. Um, so the question there, for those who can't see it, reads, uh, provide a response to the following RFP question from the perspective of a datis, us. Uh, referencing the framework, uh, anyone who's worked with us will probably be aware of what the framework is and does. The question is, describe your experience with metadata-driven ETL deployments. So if we hit go with that, um, this is not hooked up to our data. This is just using your sort of vanilla LLM model um, and integration or sort of interaction with that. So it's produced a response. Um, it's kind of light on specifics and there's a few factual errors in there uh, using BIML, for example. Um, it's basically taken a guess as to what a metadata, um, metadata driven ETL deployment should be or could be without actually tying that directly to the way that we do things. Um, to sort of solidify that point, I can ask it um, to sort of list some projects and clients where we've taken this approach. Due to confidentiality, I can't discuss, so it's been clever, it just doesn't know um, because it doesn't have access to the clients that we've worked with uh, or sort of any specifics around how we deliver projects. Um, that's actually a new one. I've not seen that one. Um, so, as I've said, generative. Um, so, yeah, hopefully this is making the point that we can basically query, um, we can use the, the chat, chat GPT model, so GPT 3.5, to start interacting. And if I want to, I can say something like, tell me a story, um, and that will produce something. Um, once upon a time, there we go. So I can generate something not hugely, you know, applicable. If I sort of reset this and I'll go back into my settings, if I want to start using my own data, then I can sort of toggle on use vector database and also document intelligence, which I'll come back to in a while. What this gives me is a load of different options. This gives me access to specifying my server. Um, so the vector database is actually hosted within Cosmos DB, as Ben mentioned earlier, taking Fabric as the foundation, building a Cosmos DB instance, which then sort of serves the sort of open AI app. Uh, I can specify some things in here. So my username, my password, um, and I can choose a database. So I might choose a data pre-sales, for example. And then within my collection, uh, for those not familiar with Cosmos DB, this is sort of akin to a NoSQL table, if you like. Um, so I'll choose bid response content. Um, I then hit apply again and go back to my chat back. Um, I can start asking some of the same questions. Now, because I've specified that I want to use my own data and I've actually limited um, the engine in terms of what knowledge it's able to use, um, this should tell me that it doesn't know or it can't answer. There you go. So how many people live in London? I don't know. There's no information in the database about the population of London. OK, so we basically precluded the bot from being able to step outside of itself um, and be able to answer questions from its own database. 
This is important because we don't want to introduce any kind of hallucination or generic answers that may not be factually correct based on our organisation. Now, if I produce the same question again uh, that I asked earlier where it gave a generic response and then hit go, um, this will give us back something a lot more specific. It will call out some different things that are specific to our Adatus framework. Uh, things like, if I read this properly, um, uh, rapid incorporation of additional data entities beyond the MVP, uh, reduced delivery times, uh, ingestion of data sources from SQL Server. Um, yeah, all sort of factually correct. Ben will tell me if it's not, I'm sure, or well done. Um, yeah, allowing you to take a remember everything forever. That's a quote and that's you know something that's attached to the framework. So I know that that's pulling from real information. If I then ask it to sort of prove that it's actually coming from our data and list out some projects and clients, um, it should be able to do that because, oh, it's not able to do that. Um, so I can verify this in a second, but I'll move on for now. Um, so if I then go a little bit more specific, um, so let's say hypothetically that this RFP question that I've typed in here, that came from an, an organization in the housing industry, for example. So I can specify that. How does the above response, uh, I'm going to, because of that one, I'm going to say, how do the above responses apply to the housing industry, reference our experience in that sector. Let's see what this comes back with. Um, we have experience in the housing sector. Um, it's naming a few clients, uh, which for this purpose is good. This is what we want to so make sure that it actually knows what it's talking about. Um, it's giving us some information around uh, 22 key data sources into a Dynamics uh, CRM system. Uh, experience developing a well-designed continuous improvement and continuous deployment uh, and continuous testing process and DevOps. OK, so this is referencing some real things that we've done with real clients, um, which could form the basis of a of an RFP response. <coughs> Excuse me. If we go even further beyond that and start asking, everything so far has been around sort of ETL platform development um, and some experience in the housing industry. If we ask it then now to pivot and say, what experience do we have in this industry for data science based use cases? So no longer talking about ETL and platform, we're talking about data science. If I hit go, um, it'll be able to give me back another response. Um, uh, data science experience in data science based use cases in housing, um, retail reporting platform uh, for Heathrow. So it's not perfect. It's mentioning different clients outside of um, outside of housing, but it's trying to give me a yes answer, which is kind of where the prompt engineering comes in. We need to we need to coax it and we need to check it and we need to get it to check itself to make sure that what it's giving us back is factually correct. So I'll move on. A data has designed and implemented data science workspace to store statistical ML, AI and basic models in their outputs. Um, OK, this is more sort of data science relevant and also it's tying it into sort of, you know, previous questions as well. Um, yeah, talking about op model, talking about roadmaps, things like that, um, and mentioning some clients. So what I can do now is I can, I've made the point a few times around limiting the information in here only to information that we've got in order to preserve its factual accuracy. What I can now do is I can type in what sorts of AI use cases would be applicable hypothetically um, to the housing industry and see what it comes back with. This is going to basically allows it to speculate whilst maintaining sort of grounding within our data. So if I then type that in and see what it comes back with, it's able to bullet out some use cases for me that are applicable to housing. For example, AI generated reporting for compliance management and regulatory purposes. Yep. Um, IoT based solutions for predicting, mitigating environmental hazards. Anyone who works in housing will know a few a few cases in you know recent history that have been very impactful for this. Um, so yeah, it's 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 aware of sort of what's going on, and it's also applying that to you know to the use case and the sort of chat that we've already had. Um, again, I could if I wanted to copy this out, and I could sort of take each one of these and ask it to expand on that, or I could sort of toggle off 
this and then just get it to elaborate so that it is then able to sort of reference its sort of wider knowledge base. Um, finally, uh, I'm going to ask it to summarize all of the above. So this says summarize this chat in its entirety. What have we discussed? So does it have memory over all of this stuff that we've been talking about? Can it synthesize that and can it summarize the entire thing? Um, Finally, make the answer appropriate to an executive audience and include the Adatus USP. See what that comes back with. Uh, so yeah, this is talking about uh, us being a Microsoft data and AI solutions provider. Uh, it's talking about our experience, uh, a pragmatic approach to data platform deployments. Um, yeah, mentioning, uh, yeah, bringing together technical architectural industry and business expertise. Um, and then it is referencing our USP in there as well, as well as referencing earlier discussion around sort of ETL deployments and other services such as what Dan demonstrated earlier around sort of Power BI reporting, for example. Um, that pretty much takes us to the end of this demo. Um, it's probably worth mentioning before I do that this is a this is one application of you know OpenAI and how that could be used in a business context. Um, Dan has already demonstrated the sort of end-to-end -end ETL process um, within Fabric. The actual engine, the sort of, you know, the, the mechanics of how this is working don't necessarily need to be served through an app, nor do they need to, you know, satisfy things like bid response. This would work equally well for things like uh, querying HR policy. This could be used more on a, a sort of capability and a sort of functional basis to address data quality problems as part of an ETL pipeline, that sort of thing. So, the technology itself is very versatile. Um, we can basically take that and build out, you know, lots of sort of custom applications or use cases, you know, based on business requirement. Um, so that's the demo there. I think I hand back to Ben. Yeah, sure. Thanks for that, Adam. Um, I will just share this slide deck again. OK, brilliant. Um, yeah, so thanks to the guys for the, delivering those demos. That was really good just to see the some of the tools in action. So that's all we had in terms of the, the content for today's session. We've got some time at the end for Q&A, so feel free to, to put any questions you've got in the, the chat and we'll be able to answer them. Um, in terms of next steps, so off the back of this session, we're, we're offering a, a free Fabric and Azure OpenAI workshop. So that's basically a half day workshop hosted with some of our consultants where we can come in and look at your existing architecture and potentially look at how tools such as Fabric and OpenAI can fit in. And, and then obviously come up with a plan for, for how that how we can make that a reality. Um, we're also able to offer short proof of concept type engagements around Fabric and also OpenAI. And to deliver those, we're able to leverage Microsoft funding as well. So there's some really good funding options at the moment to, to kind of get to, to get started with tools like Fabric with a, a really low cost. So, um, so yeah, feel free to get in contact with us about any of those options and we can get those organised.